In this series we're going to be having a look at waves. We're going to look at the many and varied properties of waves as well as the many and varied different types of waves that we can come across in nature. Some of them you might have come across before, some of them might be novel. Uh, just to start with we're going to introduce some of the ways that we can describe properties of waves and these are the properties that we're going to be describing. So one is displacement, amplitude, wavelength, then period and frequency. There are others and we'll cover a few others in some of the other videos and then there's plenty more which should be on the scope of this um, but these are the ones that we're going to have a look at today. Uh, so a wave is anything that oscillates, that moves back and forth, um, moves around in a repetitive motion and most of the waves that we come across in nature take this sort of sinusoidal shape. So in any maths courses you might have done, you might have come across this sinusoidal sine wave shape and the majority of waves uh, do take this sort of shape. So if you have a look at the uh, a water wave on the surface of a pond, if you were to look at it, it would take this sort of shape. Uh, light waves that make up light uh, will have this sort of shape and many many other examples have a sinusoidal shape to them. Um, so you can see this wave I've got here, I've stuck it on a pair of axes and um, we're going to have two different sets of axes uh, but we'll, and we'll look at them separately. Um, and these axes allow us to describe the wave and identify some of these properties. So uh, on this set of axes we're going to label a couple of things. So this x-axis we're going to have as time and along the y-axis we're going to have the displacement of the wave. So the displacement would be measured in distance of le in units of length so in this case we'll go for meters and time is of course measured in seconds. So what this graph would show is if we were looking at something that was undergoing this wavy motion we might be looking at a single point and watching as it goes up and down up and down over time. So an example of this is if we were looking on the surface of a lake or the sea and there was a flotation marker, a buoy or something like that and we just watched that buoy and as waves passed over the buoy we watched as the buoy went up and down, up and down over time. And So that's what this graph would represent. Um, so the first thing we're going to discuss is the displacement and that's just what this axis is showing. So we can see if we were having a look at this point here then we would say that at this point in time the wave had a displacement of this much. So it's how far it is from the equilibrium position. So you can see we're going up and down and it's all about this zero point, this x-axis and that's what we would describe as the equilibrium position or the undisplaced position. So if the sea, if um, we were looking at this sea or this lake and it was perfectly level, there was no wind, there were no waves, then this is the level that the sea would take. But because we've got this wave then over time it goes up and high, higher and lower, higher and lower. So the displacement is just how far are we from this point at any point in time. So we'd say what's the displacement at this time, what's the displacement at this time, so on and so forth. Which leads nicely on to the amplitude of a wave. So the amplitude is the maximum displacement. So we can see here if we were to come along here to the peak of this wave then regardless of what the time is, this is the amplitude. So we'll label that A, that is the amplitude. Amplitude, that'll do. Um, and the amplitude, uh, we must take care of, is the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position. A common mistake might be to take the peak to trough amplitude, so from this high point to the lowest point here. That would not be the amplitude, that would be twice the amplitude. The amplitude is just from the equilibrium position to the maximum displacement. And that could be from the equilibrium to a peak, it could be from the equilibrium to a trough. Both of those should give the same displacement for pretty much any wave. So the maximum displacement above or the maximum displacement below um, 
they'll obviously have different signs, so positive or negative, but the value would be the same. So if this was a one meter wave, then we would find that down here, uh, the lowest displacement would be minus one meter. Um, so that's amplitude and displacement. Next, we'll have a look at things that we can measure because we've got this plotted on the time axis. Um, so we can see on this wave, we've got this repeating motion. We go up and down, up and down. We can see that if we go from here to here, that's one full cycle of the repeating motion. So if we start here, come along here, down, up again to the next peak. As we continue from here, we're then repeating the motion that we had here. So we've got this cycling motion. And we can measure the time it takes for one of these cycles to complete. So this time across here is something that we could measure. And we would call that the period. And we typically label that as an uppercase T. So we can measure the period of the wave. How long does it take for one complete cycle of this motion to complete? So that's the time per cycle. This is very closely related but distinct from the frequency which we'll label which we tend to label with an F. So the frequency of a wave uh, rather than being a measure of the time per cycle, it's how many cycles we can fit in a particular time. And we would get that that is very closely related to the period, but it is the reciprocal. So if we wanted to find the frequency, it's 1 divided by the period. Similarly, if we wanted the period, that would be 1 divided by the frequency. Um, so the period is time per cycle. Frequency is how many cycles in a given time. Um, so period would be measured in seconds. Frequency we m would be the reciprocal of seconds. So um, we can run through a quick example calculation if we measure this period to be 0.1 seconds, then the frequency would be 1 divided by 0.1, which would give us 10. Um, we can see the units are going to be the reciprocal of seconds, so per second. So 10 cycles per second is what that means. But this per second, in this context, we give it a different uh, name, a special name for that unit, and that is the hertz, which is an uppercase h, lowercase z. And so rather than writing 10 per second, we would typically write 10 hertz. Uh, next up, we've got this uh, same shape graph again. And uh, the y-axis is still going to be the displacement. Uh, but along the x-axis, rather than time, we're going to have position. Uh, and this is also measured in units of length. So this time, rather than looking at a single point over time, so a single point in space and monitoring it over time, we're going to go for a single point of time and monitor it over space. So rather than looking at a uh, buoy in a fixed position and then looking at what it does over time, what we might do is imagine taking a snapshot, a freeze frame, a photo of the surface of a lake with some ripples across it. And then this represents what's the displacement of those ripples as we look along the lake. So if we um, so imagine the surface of a lake, we've just chucked a stone in, we've got some ripples coming out, we take a snapshot and this might be, over here might be where the stone went in and over here is further away at a couple of seconds um, and we've taken this after a couple of seconds, so this wave is coming out. And we're just looking at what's the point, what's the displacement of the wave, say, uh, one centimetre, two centimetre, three centimetre, four centimetres away from some given point. Uh, so on this graph, we can still label the amplitude. We could still read off displacements, but we'd be reading off a displacement at a particular position rather than a displacement at a particular time this time. And the range from one peak to the next, from one cycle to the start of the next point in the ne uh, of the to the same point in the next cycle, 
also has a significance. So this time, rather than what's the time for one complete cycle to pass, we're saying what is the distance over which a complete cycle um, lasts. And this is what we would call the wavelength. Uh, so that would be measured in meters or uh, units of length. So it could be um, visible light, for example, would have wavelengths very short. So nanometers, 10 to the minus 9 meters, radio waves can have extremely long wavelengths, up to several kilometers long, um, but in units of length. And we give wavelength a special symbol, which is the Greek lambda. So lambda is the wavelength of a given wave. So these are the wave properties that we've had a look at. We've got the amplitude, which is from the undisplaced position to the peak. We've got the displacement, which is at a particular position or time, how far are we from the undisplaced, from the equilibrium position. And then by plotting waves in two ways, so displacement against position or displacement against time, that allows us to measure these additional properties. So the, on the position axis, we can measure the wavelength. So what's the distance from one peak to the next? or from one trough to the next, from one point in a wave to the same point in the next cycle. Um, and then on the time axis we've been able to measure the period, so what's the time for one complete cycle to pass, and then by taking the reciprocal of that we get the frequency, which has its own special unit, the hertz, which is really just a per second or seconds to the minus one.